Okay, Matt Blair, thank you so much for being here on the podcast. Uh, it's an honor and this is going to be fun. Lots of stuff to talk about. So I'm just going to dive into it if that's cool with you. Absolutely, man. Uh, yeah, I appreciate the invite. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So the first thing I want to hear about is if you could take us a little bit through your healing journey. That's one of my favorite things I like to extract and about people. So going through the healing journey thus far, some of the gifts that have kind of come from that, and then we'll take it from there and maybe end up with kind of where you are now and where you are now. But you know, how'd you get here? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And it can be pretty long. So I'll, I'll give you the overview. Mm. The way that I like to describe it is I was always interested in martial arts and mindset and mind power and human potential. And as a kid, I was doing martial arts and doing all kinds of weird things. And when I got into my teenage years, I was always athletic. And I transferred what I learned from martial arts into the athletics because martial arts is about mind, body, spirit. Um, it's a, you know, you're adding things like concentration, um, visualization and these tactics I was bringing into other sports, but not really registering that other people didn't do that naturally. And so in my teenage years, I'm, I'm skateboarding and snowboarding and I start to read about consciousness and meditation and altered states and uh, anything to do with mind power, lucid dreaming. Um, I was very curious about all those things. And when I finished high school, I went to college, still studied some things. But when I was done college, I went out west and I started snowboarding, still researching all the stuff that I could around consciousness, mindset. And I became a snowboard instructor in Whistler. I became an international snowboard coach. And I was teaching these kids a high level uh, freestyle snowboarding, uh, trained some Olympians and things like that. And what surprised me was none of them knew anything about visualization, how to quiet their mind, their internal dialogue, all these very important things that I took for granted from uh, learning martial arts, but also studying. I was studying a lot about uh, sports psychology, peak performance, hypnosis, literally everything to become a better athlete because I wanted to be the best snowboarder that I could. I wanted to fly through the air and see, do all the things that I could see everyone else do. And so I was really um, applying those techniques, but no, it wasn't very popular at the time. When that kind of ran its course, I did seven years snowboarding, seven or eight years in Whistler. I snowboarded about 150 days a year, um, was, you know, studying and reading books the whole time. You know, what I, I really like to immerse myself with the experts. So one of the things I want to do is train with Shaolin monks because I want to know what the limits of human potential are. And those guys are doing things that I don't see anyone else on the planet doing. So I trained with Shaolin monks. I trained with a, in a professional MMA camp in Thailand. I went to meditate with monks in Nepal. And at the time, I didn't realize Mount Everest was there. So I ended up trekking Mount Everest and surviving a near-death experience. And that was a really profound trip for me. And then after that, I would say the next six years or so, maybe even more, I was traveling the world. I uh, went to Egypt. I went to all these different places, either snowboarding or exploring and learning and try to immerse myself in fields and in places that would help me grow the most in whatever I was most curious about. And so that's kind of the short story. And I think somewhere in there, like four or five years ago, I started the podcast and it was with just the intention that having um, meaningful conversations because there's very few people that I could talk to about all the stuff that I was interested in uh, mindset, human potential performance, planetary peace, uh, you know, a new upgraded civilization, what systems would we need to change? How do we stop the horrendous things happening on the planet? Like human trafficking, uh, forced organ harvesting, uh, starvation, war, things like that. And so not a lot of people are interested in those conversations I found. And so I uh, started the podcast to try to get a handle on those things and, and uh, so it's been about five years and almost 400 episodes later. And so I've been doing that and, and wrote a book and did a bunch of other things. So that's, that's the high level overview. I don't know if I gave you too much or not enough, but uh, there you go. No, that's perfect. And yeah, that's, uh, you talk to a lot of brilliant people um, in these fields and smart people and just how yeah, I really do have these super intellectual conversations and it's very cool stuff. I encourage people to check it out. Uh, a couple things popped up when you were talking that I have questions about. Well, one is just yeah, I'm kind of like my inner child lighting up about all like that and the martial arts stories too, because that's something I was always so obsessed with and still kind of am, but uh, yeah, never got to. Well, I did actually study Kung Fu while in Thailand. Didn't end up going to a professional MMA camp, but I was studying Tibetan Kung, Kung Fu there. That was really cool. And but I was going to say, oh, the, I've also talk, heard you talk about the near-death experiences and how you've had multiple and that, you know, kind of shaping your perception of things. 
And can you yeah, share a little bit more about the one that you mentioned here? And then also I have a question too about near death experiences because I hear that word used for two different things. And one of them being when somebody like physically dies and then their kind of consciousness goes somewhere else. And the other one where uh, people are still embodied but come are have an encounter in which that they could have very easily been killed. Uh, is there a different lingo I'm missing there? Or what, what can you enlighten yeah, me about well, that? Yeah, that's well, that's a really great distinction because mine, I was always within my body. My Well, actually, shoot, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, because I have had several, I'm like, which one is it? Um, holy crap. Okay, interesting. Yeah, one of them, I think that my body was ready to die, and that was on Mount Everest. What happened was I was trekking up and and... Like I said, I didn't even know Everest was there when I went to go meditate with the monks. I was like, oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so a guy asked me, like, do you want to trek Everest? And I was like, well, I'm here, so I may as well. And so there's two peaks. There's one called Gokuri, and it's supposed to be a little bit more beautiful because I had a camera and I like taking photos. But Mount Everest is Mount Everest. So I was like, I got to go to base camp. So what you can do is you can go up to Gokuri, and then you go down and three days back up to base camp. And what happened was when I got to Gokuri, we were hiking for so many days and we were about to see the amazing view of the Himalayas, everything we had come for. And we were tired that night and our guide says, Hey, well, you can go up now or you can go in the morning. And I was traveling at this point with another guy, like we had met kind of on the, on the trail and we were just hiking together and we decided we we're going to go up in the morning. Well, for the first time in six days, it was foggy the next morning. We didn't even see that coming. We didn't even think about it. And we couldn't see anything. Couldn't see the view. Couldn't see uh, what we had come for. And I was super angry. <laughs> Very, probably one of the most <laughs> angry times I've been in my life. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, what a waste. The night view was spectacular. I do remember that. But I was so mad. And so we had to walk one day down and then three days back up to Mount Everest. So on the way down, it kind of, uh, it was a nice walk. It was super pissed off and, and we slept and there was a little bit of snow when we woke up. We walked a day and then the next day there was uh, a huge snowfall. It was knee and waist deep. It was nuts. And so my guides told me, they said, hey, everybody in the, in the place was staying still. Nobody was going anywhere. They said, if you want to see base camp, you need to go today because you don't have enough time because I had a flight out where I was going to Thailand to train MMA. And so I was like, all right, well, let's try and go. So we end up going. And at first it's kind of funny. We're trekking through knee and waist deep snow and we don't get anywhere. We're for about two hours and we can't even get through this valley. So we, we sidetrack down to this other hut. That's not very far from where we had started. I look at the guides again and they say, well, if you don't get to that next checkpoint, you're not going to see Everest. And so I was like, well, I'm definitely making it. So at this point, I'm already drenched. I'm already exhausted. Everything is like the clothes I have are not designed for waist deep snow. You know, I'm, I'm sweating profusely because if you've gone through waist deep snow, you know how much energy that sucks up. Plus, I'm getting close to altitude now. And I start to walk out again and all my clothes are drenched. My feet are drenched. My boots are now all wet. Um, I'm wet inside and outside. And so we start walking and then now it starts to change. The weather changes. It was sunny. Now it's getting colder. A uh, storm is coming in and it's the temperature is dropping rapidly. I get to this steep incline and I had started to lose my energy along the way. And I just was using my you know, sports psychology techniques saying, yeah, plenty of energy. You know what I mean? One step at a time. And, and I started to get drained pretty rapidly. We end up seeing one other person and they are walking down, not up. And they say, don't keep going. Nobody's left. So we were the only ones other than these people. They went down and we were the only ones to try to go up. They said, don't go um, because it's super deep. And, and uh, it's, it was a really hard trek. And basically the guides tell me the same thing. If you don't make it to that next spot, then you're not going to see Everest. And that for me was unacceptable. I didn't, you know, I didn't care. So I kept going and at this steep incline, that's where things started to shift because what I was telling myself wasn't working anymore. I was feeling super exhausted, very tired, very cold. Um, I started to feel a little bit numb and I started to rest on some of the rocks. And now the temperature had really dropped. The clouds were in the sky and we're, we're starting to get close to nightfall. And I kept, I kept trying to get up this, this pitch. And what happened was at this point, I started to get closer and closer to sleep on these rocks. And I was pretty far away in either direction from any kind of cabin. And I heard a voice, my own voice. It was me telling me, it's okay, Matt, go to sleep. 
And you know, you have a, an internal dialogue, but it was like outside of me. It was something that I had never experienced in my life. It was like me outside of me telling me it's okay to go to sleep. And so at that point, I was like, uh oh, I'm in trouble. And that's the first time I recognized that I was in danger. And from that point, I think it was like a shock experience. I was like, I got to get through this. And so kind of like a robot, I was able to power through another hour and a half, uh, a steep incline, then through uh, a patch of really deep snow and eventually to this cabin. And when I had finally arrived at this cabin, I could have dropped. I saw the cabin a few hundred meters away at one point. I could have just dropped and been totally fine. I had to cross a glacier of uh, water. And so I couldn't even feel the, the ice water in the top of the Himalayas at that time. I just walked through. It was up to my knees. And I get in there and, and I can't eat. And they have this fire for me. And uh, <laughs> it was pretty nuts. And I made him make another fire for me. And the next day I was super drained. I, I, I slept through the night and thought it was okay. But I was super drained. I ended up getting helicopter lifted out. And what had happened was when I talked to a doctor, he said, you know, basically what you had was a combination of things of altitude sickness, um, but also because you were expending so much energy, right? Doing the craziest CrossFit workout you could imagine over time or the craziest endurance uh, workout at the time, you're working up that, that sweat. So then you're getting cold and you're not getting the same oxygen to the blood. So Ben, as a, your body was shutting down and had you gone to sleep, the chances of you staying asleep and the body basically shutting down because they're not going to get me helicoptered out. It's going to be maybe two kilometers at least in either direction up or down to get back to where safety would be. I would have been toast. And so that was one of the experiences. And, uh, it was, it was, uh, is very interesting. I've never had that before since to have like your own voice outside of you um, telling you, you know, it's okay, go to sleep. And so I was able to get through that one. And then the other ones were just close to death. So I had a gun pulled on my head in, in a forest in Cambodia or no, uh, in Guatemala, uh, in, in Cambodia, there was a guy that was going to get killed by a machete. Um, and I stepped in front of him and what was the other one. And I almost fell off a cliff in Sedona. And snowboarding a couple times too, I think. <laughs> too many. Jeez. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I have a couple of questions. One of them is about the uh, yeah the experience was well. So first, uh, with the ever Everest experience, what did you learn about yourself from that? You know, for me, because I was always really passionate about wanting to travel, train with the monks, do all the things I was doing. When I was in the hospital bed, it was just an affirmation for me of how I live my life. Um, and that's the difference I feel like I've always had for most people. For me, I guide my life and I think about who I am, what do I want to do, and how can I give back? Those are, the, those are like kind of three characteristics I really embody and I write down and I journal about. What do I want to experience here? What do I want to learn? How can I give back? How can I make a difference? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to explore? How do I make the most out of my life? These are questions I've been asking myself for a long time. And it's so weird that people don't ask themselves those questions. You know, when I went to Burning Man, it's, it's such a wild experience. Very quickly, you say, you know, how are you? Do you enjoy your life in the world? And most people say no. I'm like, well, what do you want to do? Like, what would you do if you could do anything? And they're like, I've never thought about that. I was like, how have you never asked yourself that question? So that's a question I've been asking myself for a long, long time. When I was snowboarding, I wanted to be snowboarding. And then I decided that I knew, you know, I knew for a long time I want to travel. And so I figured out and I went traveling. And so for me, it was just an affirmation of, you know, good job for doing what you wanted because if you died at least you were doing what you wanted you can you can die saying hey you know you were you were going for the things that you were passionate about that you wanted to experience and it's like honoring your intuition and who you are it's not going to be a clear road with safety and security and uh, um, certainty no road is right so if you can get clear on who you are what you want to do what you want to experience, what you want to learn, what you want to explore, and how can you give back and how can you contribute? I feel like if you can do those things, which sounds simple, but very few are, are able to do. And so that was a big one for me. It was just kind of like, you know, you're on the right track. Like, keep, keep that up. That's good. So it wasn't like, wow, you're a stubborn son of a bitch type of thing. <laughs> it was like, no, good job. <laughs> 
Yeah, <laughs> kind of, because I feel like a lot of people who have those, uh, like you said, those near-death experiences, whether whether it's out of body or whether um, it's like a close call. Uh, I've I've done almost 400 interviews and people have cured themselves of terminal illnesses like cancer, um, you know, transformed their life into living their life purpose. It was always the this awakening that they had to ask themselves important questions. And what they had to do is let go of that certainty and security of, oh, I do this because. I work this job I hate because. I do this because. I don't have that. You know what I mean? I've never operated that way. And so all the awakening experiences for people, that's what happens to them. And then they honor that on the other side. And unfortunately for most people, they need some sort of very powerful catalyst, whether it's a health problem, whether it's a loss of a job, whether it's a loss of a, a partner, they need something traumatic to jolt them out of this um, way of living that they believe is the only way and it's the secure way and they rationalize and justify living this way, although they're not passionate about it and they're happy and, and many people being very, very miserable. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question on that, but I want to go back to my other one, which was about that voice that came from the outside. So I, I've had, I guess, multiple near death experiences, like not the disembodied ones just from like my combat experiences in Afghanistan, but then, and there was also a, I guess you could say a disembodied near death experience, or just actually it was a death experience um, induced by a, uh, the toad medicine. Are you familiar with that? The five yep. MEO DMT. Yep. Um, as in Mexico, we called it sapo or sapito. And that was, I experienced what you, what you just mentioned, the voice coming from the outside. And so after, like when I, in the very beginning of it, it was, <laughs> it was awful. And yeah, basically <laughs> it ended up like where I was, being choked like if a hands of run were around my neck choking me while I was underwater and that's what I was experiencing you know I've come wow. to find out like my body didn't move at all and then in, in my own experience I was fighting for my life and then a, my voice came from the outside and said you can have it and I just started repeating you can have it and then I said more on the internal I guess voice said you can have it to this darkness and then I surrendered and then died and then the experience went on to a bunch of um, you know other stuff, and but I'm but you made me curious now. Like with that voice coming from the outside, have you reflected on like they reflected on that? Like what does that mean? And I you know, I never really got any insights for me because I was like, yeah, like why is this feel like it's coming outside into me? Yeah, wow. Well, that's a deep question, and five uh, meod can be some powerful powerful stuff, and I can imagine the level of uh, training and some of the things that you've done to, you know, be, be a warrior and be in that kind of situation. It's a uh, very mm, inspiring. And also, uh, you know, I recognize the challenge in that because I've done a lot of challenging things. And so, you know, kudos to you for being able to, you know, go through all that and, and do everything that you had to do to be that person. And, and congrats on what you're doing now for, you know, talking about some of the challenging aspects, because I feel like in a lot of warrior settings, there's no room for empathy. There's no room for emotion. Um, but really when we master those two worlds, that's I, for me, I feel how we master ourselves and how we move in this world, right. With that certainty, with that level of understanding of what we're capable of, but also with a high degree of emotional intelligence, compassion, and certainty in a direction of um, integrity and service and and passion for what we're made of and what we want to contribute so being able to steer it all in that direction now for your question you know i have thought about it and i have no idea because it was me it was me talking to me which was so weird um, but not internal dialogue and so what i thought was and what i felt in my life is that there is something beyond this i don't think that we just die and we go to a hole it's i i believe that because of a lot of things I've read. I believe that because of some of the direct experiences that I've had where I've been, I don't know if you want to call it out of body or, you know, in the oneness state or, you know, in the Tao and the ether and when you are everywhere and everything simultaneously, but not you, I've had those experiences. And so that makes me believe that life goes on. And I feel like it was a glimpse into that realm. And just from a scientific level, if that sounds a little bit out there for, for some people, if you, uh, check out the visible light spectrum. We see only a very small fraction of the visible light spectrum. And most people believe what we see is reality. Well, we're not even seeing 95% of the visual reality. We're not hearing 
Um, you know, I don't know how much of the sound spectrum we're not sensing probably, you know, a fraction of what could be sensed. And so if we believe reality is just what we experience through our physical senses, and then you take a, a look at the science on what it is we have a capability of, of seeing, hearing, and smelling, it's very minimal, like a polar bear's nose versus our nose or a dog's, you know what I mean? Um, our eyes, uh, it's, it's just amazing. So it's a, I believe there is so much more information, uh, energy, and understanding that is way, way beyond the conscious mind because the conscious, conscious mind can only hold, it says, about seven bits of information. And, and if that's what we're doing, how can we access everyone and everything um, you know, to this deep level of knowledge? It's something that you need to surrender into. And, and that's when they talk about in spiritual books and these, these yogis and these masters, which I've always been very interested in, you know, one of the concepts is surrendering. And I'm sure when you had your, your toad experience, it's, it's a surrender, it's a forced surrender. And we're not very good at that. And that's life. We only know a little bit of a little bit. We can't be focusing on a thousand things at once. We can only really handle, you know, a few things at once. That's when we drive, you got to drive. And then, you know, when you get good at driving and it becomes unconscious, you just think about crap when you drive, but that's really not, accessing a lot of information that's just thinking and if you look into meditation and buddhism and things like that it's like you know uh one of my friends puts it kind of funny he's like thinking is like the masturbation of the mind or something it's like it doesn't really serve a lot of function it's just kind of spinning its wheels and and uh, not doing too much productive uh, work and so focus and attention and presence is going to bring you more experience of of what life is and there's just we can only, it's like, I can't remember the analogy I used, but it's like infinite, infinite, unfathomable amount of information. We don't even know what we don't know. You know, it, it, there's just so much information. And so we need to be humbled by that fact that we're only perceiving a little bit. So that's a bit of a rant and I'll, I'll quit there and see if you want to jump in. No, I like it. I like it for sure. And a few things have come up and you also... Well, one, thank you for the kind words from before. And then two, thanks again, because I, I just got a little more pieces to like that question and the experience. And I think that it will perhaps relate to you as well. And one of them was, well, so definitely the whole experience. Yeah, if you had to give it one word is, was surrender. And then uh, my favorite metaphor is Gandalf the gray to Gandalf the white in terms of what happened throughout the whole experience. <laughs> and, but at, at the end too, it was, or not the end and part of it, but I so after like, you know, experiencing all these different deaths, at one point there was this one world where I was just floating in this void, like gives me like chill already. And I can feel it in my chest, like this void of what appeared to be isolation, just like, as if I was just floating in this darkness and I was the only thing existed and there was nothing else. But strangely, there was something else. And there were even in, like about to cry. <laughs> even within that uh within that darkness and within that isolation there was still a sense uh a sense of love and that is kind of giving me some other insights so first going back to the, the voice coming from the outside um what kind of, what came up and i was getting chills on it was this idea that we are we are the universe you know we are their one mind god's mind you know is is our mind and so that voice that came from what we perceived as the outside was just God's voice radiating to us through our own voice. And that message coming, you know, from, from, yeah, the spirit universe, whatever like that energy is. And then the second part was, you know, floating there in that void of isolation, but yet still somehow feeling that sense of love um, leads me to kind of believe, and I guess this is true of a lot of teachings that whatever we you know, say we live in a particular universe or multiverse, whatever one, the, the dominant energy behind this one, I truly believe is love. Because even in the most, you know, darkest of dark places um, of eternal isolation, uh, there was still, for some reason, I still felt, could sense the presence of love even within that darkness. So, yeah, perhaps I'm going off tangent, but the main, the main point was that voice coming from the outside to me feels like, yeah, um, the universe or God or, you know, whatever higher power creation speaking to us just you know but it just it's filtered through our own voice does that resonate at all or 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, for me, um, it makes perfect sense. I know exactly what you're talking about. I feel like for other people, they might not know it because it's like one of those experiences that you, you kind of need to have to understand. It's almost like, how do you describe what swimming is like to somebody that has never been in water? You, you really can't do it. And so I feel like that's partially what you're experience, sharing. And, and I've had some of those experiences to you know, have that surrender. And one of the analogies actually was on, um, you know, one of my um, plant medicine journeys, which, which can be powerful. And it's interesting because I've had plant medicine journeys and I've also done very, very deep, intensive spots of meditation. So I went to Nepal to meditate with monks and learn meditation, which you don't need to do that, but you can. And I also spent three months of, you know, alone time in koala habitat, reading, writing, and meditating, uh, you know, for, many, many hours. And I spent a year basically meditating at least an hour a day. Some people have done way more than that. Um, and those experiences, I've had these, um, yeah, experiences like kind of what you're suggesting just through meditation, it's a lot of time and a lot of effort to get there. Um, and it's in meditation, you're not supposed to get anywhere, you know, that kind of thing. But, but what it does is it, you do sometimes get granted and offered this peek behind the veil of what everything is. And, and it is an ultimate surrender. And I remember feeling this mother's, this type of mother's love that was like my mother's love times, you know, a hundred million. And the surrender thing, remember one of the things I was shown was uh, uh, like something that I could understand, right? Like a spoon. And then all of a sudden this, force would change the spoon into something that I could never in a hundred billion years with a hundred billion other people comprehend what it would change it to. And like, whoa. And then it would give me something else I understand, like a chair. And I'm like, okay, I understand chair. And I go, boom, and it would change it to something that I don't even know what it would change it to because I could never think about it. And then all of a sudden it started speeding up more and more and more and more and more. Almost like I watched this amazing video of tr how you would have to explain a 3D plane to a somebody who lived in a 2D world, you would be so hard to do how you'd have to visually show them and, and, and understand. And so for this, it's like I'm being taught how to understand that I'm in a 5D world, but I only perceive a 3D plane. And that's what the teaching felt like. And one of the other experiences and analogies I used that I was forgetting before, it's like you see this Rubik's cube that's uh, you know 100 trillion by 100 trillion. And you know, there's no chance you could ever solve that. You know, you have to solve it hundred trillion, you know, hundred trillion, like you just can't, there's no possible way that you're ever, ever, ever going to get there. You start one move and you know, how many years would it take you to do that? And then it'll just make it even harder somehow. So when we're talking about life and how we navigate it, that's one of those basic spiritual teachings. Uh, it's in Zen. I've studied a lot about Zen and I love that. And, and it's just uh, surrender. You know, it's okay, great surrender. But how do you master surrender over a lifetime? You know, how do you how do you do that when it's not easy? Um, and so the yin yang for me is this this balance of surrender and effort, right? So I can train incredibly hard, I can train my body and, uh, and my physical body and my endurance and my skills to a high degree, but when combat happens or when execution happens, there's this, there's this level of surrender and also what you've trained in your body to, for the body to react naturally because you're not thinking about what you're doing. And I feel like that's the same thing with life where we need to put intention, we need to put effort, but we need to understand that bigger picture is up to something that's, that's beyond us. And I do think that it is a benevolent thing. And what we want to do is we want to get an alignment with harmony, with nature, with life in a way that we enjoy our expression and that expression doesn't harm a bunch of people. You know, you're not just trying to take things. One of the analogies I like for enlightenment is that, you know, an enlightened person goes from thinking, what can I get to what can I give? How can I help? And just that, that simple switch, it doesn't mean that you give your life to everything else. It's just like, how can I, you know, create value for other people well, that's how you become a millionaire and a billionaire. It's not because I think about money all the time. It's what value could I bring to people? And if that value is good and lots of people want it, they're going to pay you for it and you can earn some income and that's great. And so if we can think about, you know, one of, one of my close friends and is the, one of the wealthiest people I know is so wealthy, you know, jeepers, creepers. Um, but he just thinks about, 
how, what, you know, I think about, he goes every day. I think about how I can add value to the people, just how I can add value to people. And he's just done it really well, really methodically, got great feedback, adapted, overcame challenges. It wasn't an easy ride at any way, had huge failures, um, but that's his main focus. And I feel like so many people focus just on money, but if they focus on value, I believe they would be a lot more successful. I like that. I like that. And that brings up a, a couple of things that I actually wrote down. I wanted to talk to you about and something uh, that I've been sharing a little bit about on Instagram lately. It's been getting some good feedback or just a lot of interest. So one of them is I get law of attraction. You study law of attraction a lot, right? Yep. And I have noticed this. I, obviously, it depends where you learn, where you're learning from, who you're learning from. But it, there comes off this idea that it's easy. Um, yeah, right. Just, oh, just think different thoughts and just, you know, do this, this and that. And, and then it's just easy. You don't have to work hard anymore. You know, and then everything just kind of flows. And uh, that's not been my experience. And then also a lot of people I work with, especially, you know, right, you know I, do, I was diagnosed with PTSD, done a lot of trauma healing, help other people heal their trauma. So someone who has a lot of trauma, you can't just tell them to change their thoughts and then think that's, that's good advice. So where, how does, how does law of attraction work? What's, what's your take? Well, it's a great question. And I agree with what your analysis is. When I was in Whistler, I was lucky to attend a seminar by Michael Lozier. And he wrote the book, The Law of Attraction, The Science of Getting More of What You Want and Less of What You Don't. And we became friends and he actually mentored me for years and, and taught me what he knew about law of attraction. And I've read probably 90 five percent of the law of attractions that it, books that exist that are good anyway um you know like the abraham hicks there's one called the master key system by charles hannell who's a 33 degree freemason which is an interesting one and i really like michael lozier's book uh it, because he has an nlp background neuro-linguistic programming and so it's really applied psychology there's it, there's science to it but there's also practical um application to it and so you're able to create a system that makes sense based on logic and science for how to make it work for you. So the easiest way to wrap up law of attraction as a whole is uh, by the definition of something along the lines of, I attract to my life, whatever I give my attention, energy, and focus to whether negative or positive um, in the, you know, the law of attraction uh, responds to vibes. So like if you go into a, you, you wake up and you stub your toe and you get angry, then you spill your coffee and, uh, and you just get to work. You're like, Oh man, I, you got a really bad vibe today and I uh, should have stayed in bed. Well, vibe is a short form for another word, which is vibration. And so law of attraction matches vibration. It doesn't match what you think it matches what you're feeling and vibrating to the universe. Now, since you always say, you know, another way to put it is a, you know, your vibe is a mood or a feeling right? That's what it is, right? So happy, cheery people seem to be a little bit more lucky, a um, little bit more content. Good things usually happen. They're able to adapt quicker when crappy stuff happens, right? How we respond, it's not always great. And so the law of attraction, if it is always responding to your vibration, it's always on. And so that's why people can get into these depression loops, into these cycles, because they don't know how to break it. And so if we just think very, very simply that whatever we give our attention, energy, and focus to, we get more of, um, but then we want to be deliberate in how we use our words, how we use our language, how we manage our vibration and what we're seeing, hearing, and experiencing. And words are incredibly powerful. And most people attract what they don't want because they talk about what they don't want. They use three words, don't, not, and no. So if I say, don't think about a pink penguin, Try not to imagine a purple hippopotamus. Your mind goes ahead and does that. If you go on the internet and you put in uh, no football or uh, no chocolate um, bar, you know what I mean? <laughs> Whatever, I don't know. I was going to try to think of something different. Um, it's going to search for that thing. So your unconscious mind doesn't recognize no. When you take out the no and you're putting attention, energy, and focus on what you don't want. When I taught snowboarding in extreme sports, I don't say don't think about not falling try not to fall, we would want to really focus on what they want. And this is a huge shift for people, a huge shift in, in understanding. Whenever you say the words don't, not know, or you feel negative, just stop and ask yourself, so what do you want? So if you don't want to fall on your head and break your neck when you're trying your first backflip, what do you want? I want to land it. It switches the energy. It switches the intention. Then you tack on visualization and other tools. You can really get law of attraction working for you. So law of attraction can be boiled down to your thoughts, your habits, 
your words and your visualization. And if you put those in an, an alignment and an integrity, you're working with the law of attraction. Um, now, do miracles happen? Absolutely. You, you know, I've heard some stories where people um, really attract some absolutely amazing things. Dr. Joe Dispenza has some amazing work on healing with people doing it through meditation. And you're going to find real miracles in congruence, right? It takes you time to de develop that level of mastery, that level of belief, that level of skill. And what you're saying, I 100% agree with. So many people think they just, okay, I'm going to think a few things and then it's going to happen. It's, it's everything together. And I always see this as the highest level of peak performance and human potential possible. When I was training with the Shaolin monks, one of the masters could break stone with two of his fingers. He could break thicker pieces over his head, elbows and knees. It was unbelievable. The most um, impressive human feet I've ever seen by far and know of by far. Other Wim Hof is pretty close because he can do some amazing things. Uh, but these guys were amazing. And when I interviewed them, all they did was, uh, was apply peak performance, law of attraction, and human potential training, all three things. Because you need the mindset. You need hard qigong. So he would... We had dent holes in the academy trees from poking trees with their fingers. That's hard qigong. That's the hard work. But they would also do soft qigong, meditation, visualization, and bring the mind, body, spirit into harmony. And then the right thought and right action and right focus. So when it was time to execute, everything was together. And so just like a, a high-level athlete needs to perform at certain times, most people don't function like that. We function for the easy way out. We function for the path of, path of least resistance. And that's what our training is. And you know this from combat. If nobody trained or did any of that work, then they just watched military videos and they thought they were prepared. Well, you wouldn't want that person beside you because they actually wouldn't be prepared. You had to do a lot of hard work, a lot of training, a lot of education, a lot of practice to get to that level of mastery. And then in those spots, be able to apply that in that moment. And so for me, the law of attraction works when you have congruent, uh, congruence with all of those factors. But the thing is, most people don't add that mental factor. They only go hard work. That's traditional world, right? Only hard work, no thought, no you know, emotion, no visualization. And so it's the congruence of all those things. And that's what martial arts really teaches. It's getting very clear, you know, work very hard, but also use the visualization the correct wording and the internal dialogue of what you say to yourself, make sure that works for you and the right intention, making sure you're focusing on what I want. Like if you're trying to hit a bullseye, you don't go, I don't, I don't want to miss completely. No, you go, I am hitting that bullseye. That's my focus. And so your reticular activating system, everything, your body's going to work in harmony. That's why in snowboarding, you look where you're going. You know, when I teach people to go through the trees, I said, don't look at the tree. You're going to smoke the tree. Look where you want to go. The body's going to respond to that naturally without you even trying. Same with a car. And so that's kind of how it works is, is getting your body's natural system to work for you while at the same time, if you can, which is hard, being totally cool without not having the thing. Being totally complete, content, whole, harmonious, full of self-worth with failing, not getting the thing. Because that thing, anything outside of you, whether it's an object, material, a job, a relationship, uh, a piece of knowledge, an experience, a travel, anything outside of you that prevents you from being whole, harmonious, perfect, content, where you are now, it won't matter what that thing is because you will never be content because the goalpost of whatever it is will always move once you get to that next level. So the, the yin and yang of law of attraction is surrender and action. Yes. Okay. And then uh, another, I guess a different plant medicine, quick story for me. Uh, this one was in ayahuasca. So, and just quick note to you. Uh, yeah, I, I went, I spent like about six months in Mexico and then did just a, a different kind of medicine and with all kinds of different um, energy work and integration in between and just extracted so much knowledge from those experiences and before that i've had a lot of more you know all, all my experiences were completely you know sober and mystical and amazing but i've also had these teachings so anyway one of them was in part of my ayahuasca experience was it really did show me the truth that your thoughts do create your reality and i definitely had struggled with that and then kind of really know this all the way stuff is is bullshit like that's not the case i'm doing all the work like i am and like this wouldn't be the case i didn't know and then ayahuasca came in and, and showed me otherwise. Uh, I kicked my ass like, completely. Literally, it was me or a higher self version of me 
kicking lower self version of me like my at like just master splinter came in and just like you're you know like you know when the, the students tries to fight like eat man or something and that that was my experience but i was both of these people and then i was just absolutely so like i have a vision of a mental image of like my face like against like a window and like just like cleaning the window with it and just it took me through all these different thoughts that i experienced and it showed me how it, it you know that created my reality and it was just hilarious <laughs> um and frustrating because now i can't blame anyone else ever uh you know for for my circumstance um but then the balance has become just because that's where you are that doesn't mean that's where you're not supposed to be and there is the mm -hmm. surrender and the yearning for something else constantly just wishing you had something else all the time and that's the real problem and so yes your thoughts are creating your reality and it is why you, you are where you are but that's not always a bad thing and then yeah the, the surrender and then just the continued action is the way to kind of go up yeah, the next level in the video game. And so the question is, so what about the subconscious mind? And right, so the driver for these thoughts or the, the emotions or and feelings that are creating the thoughts, uh, how does that the subconscious come in with the conscious? Because that was kind of what was happening to me. Consciously, I'm aware of all my conscious thoughts, but that ignored all the subconscious thoughts I was having on a consistent you know, daily basis. Yeah, well, that's a really, really great question. And the first thing that I'll address is something that you said that I feel is important. And one of the other markers of what I perceive to be an enlightened person, um, because I've always been curious about enlightenment and doing so many shows and, and speaking to so many different people, I felt like enlightenment was just so far two things. There's, there's other things, but two main things. Um, the first one I already addressed is you go from not what, what can I get? You know, everyone's trying to get something. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get more. I'm going to get all of it. What can I give? That's what an enlightened person does. And also they take hundred percent responsibility for themselves and where they are, no matter what it is, because if you don't, you're always a victim and you're always blaming and you're not in an empowered space to change it. And you need those two things. And so if you could just do those two things, you're going to be way further ahead than most people and, and be in way more control because that's how you change it. Just like in combat or if you're in a fight, right? I think about martial arts or snowboarding or whatever, if I'm in a fight and I'm in a position where I'm getting my butt kicked, it's not going to help me to say, oh, you know, I'll blame it on this guy. It's like, okay, take responsibility for this. How am I going to get out? You know, and then maybe I even lose the fight. How do I come back stronger? Right? Because if it's someone else's fight, I'm, I didn't learn. It didn't help. And so the subconscious mind is such a huge topic and so important and people don't understand their subconscious mind. And this is something that I learned very early from hypnosis and meditation. Hypnosis is just meditation. Hypnosis is simply going past the critical factor of the mind, which is your, who you think you are at that point in time. So if we're having a conversation, I'm, I can only focus on you. And like I said, seven bits of information, right? I can't be processing all the other stuff, all of my memories, my thoughts, my habits, my beliefs, all that stuff is all in the, stored in the subconscious mind, right? And we, um, the way that the mind works in neuro-linguistic programming, they'll talk about mental maps of the world. A lot of those maps get shaped from zero to five. There's a quote, I can't remember who said it, but it says something along the lines of, uh, give me the man until he's, or give me the boy until he's five and I'll show you the man. And that's about basically how powerful your, your mental programming is from those ages. And the good news is you can learn to program your subconscious mind. So the first thing in practice is, is kind of a spiritual one is to purify the mind. And so to purify the mind, you need to practice it just like training. And so if your lifestyle is full of a poor diet, because that makes you think a certain way, too much sugar, too much pop, too much alcohol, uh, too much crappy diet, you feel a certain way, you have a certain level of gut health, you have a certain uh, level of emotion, certain level of energy, you're going to think certain thoughts. So just imagine a case study of a guy who's 350 pounds. He's super depressed. He eats crap food all the time. He hates his job. He uh, doesn't do anything he enjoys and how he moves around his life, those thoughts that are going to happen. Now that same guy, so let's just say we're going to take that same individual and map it over a year. Well, one guy just, the same guy keeps the same pattern, eats the crappy food, the fried chicken doesn't change himself. But then at the same time, in a different timeline, the same guy starts to eat better. He starts to think about who he is, what he wants to do thinks about his passions, thinks about his curiosities, thinks about things that light him up, thinks about mental nutriments and Buddhism mental nutriments are what are we feeding our mind? So this guy's over here 
on CNN and horror movies and CSI and all this nonsense. Now he's starting to read books. He's starting to educate him. Maybe he wanted to do painting. Maybe he wanted to explore a little bit. Maybe he liked the outdoors. Maybe uh, he wanted to do some music. Starts to feed the mental nutrients over on that side. Well, if he kept that path in a year, he would be a fully transformed person. And so our subconscious mind just like the law of attraction, it needs to be trained in the physical realm and what we're doing and so consciously changing. But it's like uh, my friend Robert Grant's a very interesting guy and he talks about the eye of Horus and the eye of Ra. And he goes, well, the eye of Horus is the, and I can't remember which one's which, but one of them's looking out in the world and what we're seeing, cars and experiences. But one of them's looking in and that's like, what are we feeling? What are we experiencing? Are we, are we reflecting upon how we're operating in this world? And so when we can get clear on how we'd like to operate in this world, we can then use things like hypnosis, affirmations, um, personal reflection to, to purify our mind, so meditation and our thoughts and our deeds. And this takes practice. It's not just, oh, it's just boom and it's done. It's just that, you know what? I, I'm always, I don't have any courage. I'm afraid of everything. So you go, okay, I'd like more courage. And you go, you know, I am more courageous. And so do something courageous in the physical world and then use that affirmation and create a hypnosis script. And that's just guided meditation. So in a relaxed state, you're going to see the things that you want. And in all my athletes and all my coaching clients, I teach them how to do hypnosis um, because it's literally guided visualization and it's incredibly powerful. Very few people use it. And it's how you program your subconscious mind. So then your habits and your beliefs and your internal dialogue starts to work for you. And when you have this mental map of the world, it doesn't just change overnight because it's this huge mental map but there is something called neuro pruning. So when you start to build something you prefer, right? Let's say you have a traumatic experience. You, you know, you deal a lot with those, you know, you have this traumatic experience. It's got a ton of energy. The emotion keeps the belief and all of those, um, those, uh, What's it called? Like on the, the things that happen on the outside, like the things that are on the wake, like you've got the main thing, but you've got the things on the outside. Like it's not tertiary, is it? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'll get there. So you, you, well, all these uh, habits, emotions, and beliefs and things that will happen because of the experience. So one simple example I use is like, if you're four years old and you had a dog you love and that, that dog got run over by a yellow truck, you would subconsciously hate yellow trucks, most likely into your, your 60s and 70s. You wouldn't even remember why at that time. Like sometimes you'd see a yellow truck and you get angry. You wouldn't even know why or it would change your state because it was such a, a crazy emotional uh, trauma at that time. And so when we have trauma in our, in our brain, it's all that emotion that goes with it. And when we can kind of flip back and we can analyze what that is and how it's affecting our behaviors, it doesn't make it go away and say, oh, that never happened, but it gives it less emotional charge, right? Let's just say you're a woman and you got beaten by a man with a beard, right? Maybe every time you see a man with a beard, I'm not going to like you then. You, you feel that emotional thing. You might even fear fear, right? Some people get crippled with fear, don't even go outside, right? Because of this mental pattern that keeps playing in their mind. So what do you want? right? So I want to feel empowered. I want to feel in control. I want to feel connected to spirit. Okay. You start writing those things down. What can I go do? What can I go do? What can I go do? And what that does is it goes from map of fear and trauma over here to what's preferred over here. How do I use that as a catalyst for something new, for something good? Um, and when you think about alchemy, it's an interesting thing. And most people think alchemy is turning lead to gold, which was part of it. It was scientific. And at the root of the spiritual teachings, it was turning the trauma of life into something beautiful, transforming it. And in Buddhism, they'll talk about, um, you know, the noble truths and saying, you know, life is suffering. And Alan Watts says a more accurate translation is life is frustrating. And if you're alive, you recognize that life is frustrating almost always. And so when we can transmute those constant frustrations that are coming up, constant traumas, and that's all a trauma is. It's, it's something that has a high emotional charge that we identify with that keeps popping up in our mental um, uh, teleprompter with, the, with the, in our inner movie. It's like, boom, trauma again, boom, trauma again, and you feel it. And so when you can start to pick it apart, figure out what it is that you want, how can you overcome it? How can you use it for a catalyst of good? How can you heal from it? And you just start writing things down. You start journaling, then you start affirming and you start putting in those positive beliefs. You start to change that inner engineering that's happening automatically. And it's going to start to work for you and limit the amount of emotion that comes with it. And that's when neuro, neuro pruning will happen where that, those connections of all the trauma will diminish, 
and the the neural connections of what you prefer, the neural maps will start to grow on what you prefer. And that's consciousness by design over time. And so one very simple thing that you could do, let's say you're experiencing uh, trauma and I've worked with some people with trauma. And so you got a bracelet on, right? The trauma comes up, right? You can do three deep breaths, just that alone. So you have this bracelet, right? And you're like, holy crap, the mental thing came up, three deep breaths. It, it, it puts you into the parasympathetic, uh, parasympathetic nervous system. You start to relax a little bit and um, you calm down, right? That's stage one is you control your breathing consciously. You take the bracelet, you put it on the other side. You can just add on, what do I prefer? I want to feel calm and empowered. So you can say, I'm calm and empowered, whatever affirmation. And what that does each time is it brings awareness to what's happening on autopilot. Otherwise, it's just going to keep happening on autopilot and you're, you're feeling out of control. And so does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then I can see the, yeah, so when like that, the charge to the emotion slowly starts to dissipate and come down, then that frees up, you know, the belief system and the thoughts for you to have more empowering thoughts and more thoughts that alignment with actually what you do want. And then that's how you start to attract in more of what you do want. And then that driver, the emotional driver, you have a new emotional driver versus, you know, the the trauma-based driver for sure. Uh, we're getting close to time. A few things I want to touch on, we won't get to, but one of them uh, was fairly related to what we're talking about, purifying the mind, connecting the spirit, trauma. I recently, well, I know you have a, you know, do a lot of like soul guidance and connection. You have a soul compass course, helping people connect with their soul. And I also heard, is he currently your mentor? Was your mentor, the uh, David Lone Bear? Yeah, yeah David, David Lone Bear, Santa Pass, yeah. So, and uh, I heard you mentioning him. Yeah, telling you to, yeah, he would tell you to go do things. You like go find, sit out in the darkness at night, and different things like that. Which uh, I love stuff like that, and you know, stillness and nature are such a, an incredible way to purify the mind. Uh, actually, one of the best things I've done recently was actually a uh, in my own kind of sit slash fast, uh, two and a half days against a tree. You know, no food, no water, and just you know, sat there in that spot the whole time, and it was incredibly purifying. So. Can you share yeah, some insights around that and then how to connect with your soul, maybe through calming your mind or however you, you know, whatever you've learned through, through him, through stillness, through yourself and how to connect with your soul? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot there. Well, uh, David Lone Bear Santa Pass is a Native American elder of the Mi'kmaq. I uh, studied with him pretty intensely for two years, two, three years. We're still in touch, um, you know, but now with the daughter, it's a little bit different. Can't go down to Maine and do all the crazy stuff he's telling me to do. Um, one of the main things for him was just simplicity, doing three kind acts a day, going out of your way to do it. Felt like that was really important. Uh, very, very simple. Uh, Also being content with where you are. I feel like his culture and what he would teach is so different than what we want. We're always trying to get stuff. And for him, it's just being more content, being just being more genuine, more authentic, more of a good person, you know, not needing so much. So those were some of his teachings and to connect with your soul and spirit. Absolutely. Uh, Less TV, nature, just period. Go out in nature, 45 minute walk a day. You want to connect to your soul. Uh, 20 minute meditation. You, if you don't know how to meditate, nobody knows how to meditate. So don't worry about it. I studied meditation. I teach meditation. I don't know how to meditate. I sit down and I watch my mind go nuts. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, so don't overcomplicate it. Just sit down, shut up, um, observe your thoughts. So that's it. And so that's one great way. Uh, journaling. So important journal of all the people that had a, had a massive transformation on my podcast from a life they hated to a life that they are so grateful for. Uh, as they said, journaling was a big piece of that. And if you look at all the great minds from back in the day, uh, they all journaled every single one. So journaling is so important. Um, prayer, I believe as well, asking for what you, you want, praying out loud, um, from David Lomberry, he said, yeah, two spirit guides, a positive and negative, not to be mistaken with good and bad. The reason why I have a positive and negative is because you need uh, those two currents to keep your body, which is the ground in the simulation. <laughs> so that was not an answer I expected. And, um, you know, he's like, so you, you have a closed system for them to help you. You need to write down or speak out loud what you want. 
and remain consistent. And so it also keeps us congruent when we look at our journals and we look at our prayers and we look what we're going for and we're asking for guidance because we're always expanding. We're always growing. When you're a child, you start with uh, your parents pushing you on this little bike thing, right? In the cart. And then you get a, your own bike and it's got the training wheels on it, right? And then you've got no training wheels. And so every time that child gets bigger, they're going to see more options for them to grow towards. But those options make us feel like we're not good enough now because we can see where we're going to go. And so if we can honor the impulse of growth, which we, which we always have with the contentment and honor and gratitude and uh, uh, worthiness and, 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 gratitude and all the good things for where we are acceptance that's the word i wanted acceptance for where we are wow this is where i'm at. i'm at the training wheels this is amazing okay the training wheels are off now we're here but i think that people as they become adults they they see this end of what's potential what they can potentially do and they just basically write off everything in between and so journaling meditation um, figuring out what your values are good community nature simple living um, you know keeping things uh, as simple and le uh, the least amount complicated as possible. Um, contentment, what you read, what you write, what you practice, all these things, anything that you want to do to express yourself. I feel like it's spiritual practice. We want to get good at writing, music, exploration, um, all those things, just how you express yourself. So if you can express yourself honest, honestly and authentically, I think you're doing all right. And I don't think we need, you know, a lot of uh, today we want these magic pills all the time. Right. And so just simplicity, you know what I mean? Bit of journaling, um, moving towards things that are uh, passionate, you know, that you're passionate about and uh, um, you're thinking about what you can give back and you're going to be guided because we're in the mystery. This thing is so mysterious. And if we're just doing those things each and every day and asking for guidance, asking to be of service, asking to be shown, taking care of our body, growing in ways, uh, forgiving ourselves for mistakes because we're not perfect. You know, like I, I did, I do good diets and I do bad diets. And sometimes I'm just like, you know, friggin' it's so hot in the summer. All I want to do is like when I'm done, drink a beer and hang out and eat like chicken wings and, and everything. And then a huge bit of ice cream. And that's not optimal human performance. I know that, but damn it. I want that ice cream and all that bad stuff. And sometimes I'm so clean with my diet, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, but that's life, you know, it's, you, you want to be observant of what you're doing and, uh, and, and do your best to enjoy the ride. And, and, and it's so vast that if we can just keep aligned with where we'd like to go and what's meaningful to us, and we're revising and reflecting on that, we're going to be guided by something bigger. So that was super convoluted anyway. Um, there's a, there's a meditation that people can have, um, I'm doing a new program around it, but it's a heart hypnosis meditation. And the soul compass course is basically to help you find your life direction because our, our minds are designed to keep us safe. We, we look both ways when we cross the street, we figure out how to make money. And the reason why it, it lies to us when we ask ourselves what we're most passionate about is because for us to survive, we need to eat. For us to eat, we need to make money. So if I say, what would you do if money were no object? You can't comprehend that. So you're going to distort your answer to make sure that you get money because your conscious mind doesn't want you to die. That's what it'll do. That's what it's designed to do. So you need to be in a state of relaxation to get past that critical factor. Who are you? What are your values? What do you want to do? Well, give yourself 10 years, give yourself 20 years. And the older I get, I'm 36 now, the more I realize stuff takes 10 years, at least five, 10 years. And I'm totally fine to work towards that. Now, when I was a kid, hell no. Um, you yeah, know, I need it right now, but you know, the older I get, the, the longer I'm, I'm willing to go in a direction because I understand that's how long it takes and to enjoy the ride as much as I can. Yeah. Thank you very much. Even within all of that, I still hear surrender in action. And I feel like that's such a yeah, important balance like, in everything that you mentioned that within, within all those things, there all are some form of surrender or action or ways to surrender or to take action and then, you know, just like let it all take form. Uh, I would love to chill out with you and have a beer and talk about the great mystery someday. But um, actually, I, real quick before we go, I just want to share with the listeners, uh, you mentioned no, uh, stop watching TV and I stopped watching TV last fall. And it, I think it's one of the best things I've done for my mental health and without even realizing it. And I had this one experience, this actually reminds me of like that out of shadows documentary as well. 
And so, cause I had this experience one time with my dreams. I noticed my dreams are very violent. I was like, why are my dreams so like, always so like violent, you know? And just like, uh, I didn't know how to describe them all. And then I had this insight, like, you know, some you know, voice within inside me I was like, what do you mean? Like, I thought that's what you like. And then I was like, you know, look at the shit you watch on TV. And like, yeah, that's all I, all I watch is, you know, action movies and kung fu movies and stuff like that. Uh, and I write, so I've just been programming my subconscious mind my entire life saying like, this is what I like, you know, speak to me like this, you know, show me things like this. Um, so I just wanted to reiterate that point. Um, yeah, thank you for that final conclusion and ending. And you said where people can find you and work with you. Do you have any other final notes, best place to follow along, get up, updates? Well, thanks. Thanks so much for having me on the show, man. I really appreciate it. And I think what you're doing is amazing. So uh, keep up the great work. It's an honor to be here. If people want to check out my work, mattbelair.com, um, I do have a, a academy with the Soul Compass course. If you're looking for life direction, it's super simple. Right now it's included in the academy. So it's only 33 bucks. Um, there's also the heart hypnosis in there. You can hit me up for that. And that's a hypnosis um, uh, meditation, guided meditation to help, you know, go through that. And, and I've done it with hundreds of people with really, really great success because in peak performance in any of these things, I need it to work. And I test every single thing. And these are the things that work the best, uh, very simple, um, ways. And, you know, I've worked with a lot of people, you know, they're like, Oh, I don't know what to do with, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And I'm like, okay. And then we're done session one and they know exactly what they want to do with, with what, with what the title of their book is and all this kind of stuff. It doesn't always a secret. Happen. Yeah. You, the secret is asking the right questions, right? What are your values? Just getting them to go through it. I just force them to answer the questions. And when you answer them, then you know, and we're just trained not to, we're, we're just not trained to, to ask those questions. It's the simplest thing, the simplest thing. And then I just stack it on top. Boom, 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 boom. And so when I do the three months, it's just the first month of getting everything out. And then we design how to make it happen. And it's, it's, it's simple. It's just, you got to make that decision. Um, and if you need any help, I'm happy to like soul compass course. If you, you know, it's easy, you can go, you're going to go through most of it. Um, if you don't have 33 bucks, you can hit me up. I will give it to you for free. I don't give a crap. Um, you know, it's to help you because whenever somebody's aligned in their own integrity and their mission, it's always of service always, 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 always of service. And so, you know, my life, I'd like to be of service. And so if they need it, they can have it and it works. And um, yeah, the more of us that can be authentic and, and think about what, what makes us happy, what we want to grow towards, it helps everything else in the environment. And so I feel it's the best service we can do for humanity. Beautiful, man. Beautiful. Yeah. 33 bucks. No brainer. Do it. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you can't afford it. Let me know. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. The, the pleasure rocking out here with you today. Um, yeah. Take care. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.